So this is a short video lesson on integration, starting in Chapter 4 of your textbooks. Uh, at this point in your calculus journey, you've gone through and you've uh, mastered the idea of taking a derivative and understanding the different properties and rules that go with those, uh, with finding the derivative. What we're going to do today in Chapter 4 is actually just going to start working backwards and saying, given a derivative, can you find the quote-unquote antiderivative, okay, going backwards, and find the original function of the derivative that was given. So here we go in our first problem right here in the top left. So again, follow along as uh, in your notes as we go on, on here in the video. If f prime of x is equal to 3x squared, they want us to find the original function. So before we dive into this type of problem, let's kind of go through some other examples of how we could work backwards. If you were given, for example, a function um, like y here that was a constant, or I'm sorry, the derivative was a constant. So if the derivative was some type of constant value, 2, 4, negative 5, 7, 0, um, not 0, but um, any other no, a number other than 0, if I wanted to find the function, how would I do that? Well, if you remember, if you took something that was that constant times x, if I took the derivative of y, I would get that same constant. So what I went from was a power of 0, and I went back up to a power of 1. Now let's say, for example, we had a derivative that was 2x, 2x. So we're kind of going up our power rule here. If I was given a derivative of 2x, the original function then, if you remember your power rule, you brought down the exponent into the coefficient, and you reduced the power by 1. Right now, I have a power of 1 and a coefficient of 2. So that 2 coefficient was originally the exponent that I brought down, so this is going to be x squared. And since I removed the 2, now I just have a 1. Now what's the derivative of x squared? 2x, and we can check that by going forward, or backwards, I guess. So now we're given 3x squared, 3x squared. And if that's my derivative, then if I want to work backwards here on my process, right? If I would do the antiderivative or the opposite of the power rule, I would take the 3 and I would move it back up into the exponent, correct? Now, I'm not going to multiply the 3 and 2 because remember, in my power rule, I took the original power of 3 and I reduced it by 1. So 3 became 2 because I had to reduce the power by 1. So here what I'm going to do is bring the 3 up and therefore change my exponent to just being x to the third power. Now again, it's really easy to check your antiderivatives by going ahead and taking that 3 and bringing it down like you're differentiating and reducing the power by 1 to get you 3x squared. So just some notation here um, as we move forward, just to make sure that we understand uh, what we're going to be doing. When we talk about antiderivatives, the notation for that is actually called integration. And you have this kind of long looking s here. This is an integral, and the way I would read this is I'm going to integrate the function of x with respect to dx, okay? And the dx is added in there uh, notationally, and we'll come back to that later on as we go into different types of integration. But when I integrate a function with respect to x, I'm going to be given the antiderivative, capital F of x, plus c. And why would I add a plus c in there? Well, if you think about it, um, if I take the derivative of, for example, um, x squared plus 2, I would get a 2x, correct? So if y equaled x squared plus 2, then y would equal 2x as my derivative. Now, what would also give me that exact same derivative? What if I had a function, let's say y of 2, that was x squared plus 3? Because 2 and 3's derivatives are 0, those, co those constant terms cancel out and disappear when I differentiate. So when I go ahead and find the integral, I always have to take in consideration there's, there's a possible constant that could be added to my antiderivative. Um, and that plus c is something that's going to come back and haunt us a lot, so we want to make sure that we keep tacking that on um, when we're doing, these are called uh, indefinite integrals or indefinite integration. So, looking at our couple example problems, um, you can follow along if you'd like uh, to help you out. 
make sure that you're answering the questions that I'm going through as well as trying the problems. If you're feeling very confident, go ahead and pause the video and work at your own speed. Always keep up with me just to check your work to make sure you're following the right steps. So here it looks like we're going to integrate is the square root of x of dx. So when we go ahead and integrate this, it's always helpful to first rewrite any type of radical as a fraction exponent to help us understand what the exponent is. So if I'm going to integrate this function, I want to make sure that I want a power of 1 half. So like here, right, I had a coefficient of 1 and a power of 1 half. So if I wanted to go backwards in my steps here, if I want to go backwards in my integration, um, if I wanted a 1 down here to begin with, I'm going to have to think about how am I going to add 1, right? I added 1 to 2 to get 3. If I added 1 to 1 half, right? If I added 1, if I added 1 to 1 half, what would that take me up to? That would get me up to 3 halves. Now the only problem with that is that that's the anti-power rule, right? Rather than reducing the power of 1 for differentiation, I'm going to increase the power by 1. However, 3 halves power, when I would have brought that down, I wanted that to, that 3 halves would have come down, I needed to multiply by some coefficient that's here right now, so that their product is equal to 1. And when I have 3 halves and a product of something, the only thing that's going to give me a product of 1 is by multiplying by the reciprocal. So the coefficient that I'm going to write out in front of the x, the 3 halves power, is 2 thirds. So when I differentiated this, this square root of x, I get 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power. Again, always adding your plus c. So that's my antiderivative, plus c. So that is my integration of that problem. Okay? And obviously with 3 halves power, I can rewrite that. Um, as a square root of x cubed if I wanted to um, with the two thirds out in front. But make sure okay, that you understand the steps of how we went from one half, adding one, making three halves, and then multiplying by reciprocal out front. Always adding your plus c. In example number two, we would integrate uh, zero uh, dx. So zero, um, if you would think about what would we have differentiated last chapter to get a derivative of zero? Well, whenever we differentiate a constant, right, like 5, 7, 8, any type of horizontal line crossing the y-axis, the derivative represents the slopes at any one point, and the slopes of a horizontal line are all 0, so therefore 0 would be my derivative of a constant. So when I'm integrating, the only thing I would have to worry about here is making sure that that was equal to c. So the integral of 0 is always going to be c, or a constant. Now, if you look at 5, again, same thing, horizontal line. But here, if I want to work backwards, right, I want to make sure that when I integrate this 5, I'm going to anti, find the antiderivative. So I'm going to have an x, 5x, right? Because when I integrate this, when I take the derivative of 5x, I get 5. But I have to make sure I also tack on that plus c as well. So we start out with something a little more complicated with the one half power. We've looked at a zero and a constant and how those differentiate. And those would be true for any types of constants. Now let's make it a little bit more challenging here. And obviously down below here you see you have some integration formulas that you can use um, and memorize throughout the, this process. But if I look at number four here, I have three secant squared of x dx. And I want to integrate this. So if I'm integrating with respect to x, then I'm going to have to think about this as... Um, 3 times a secant of x squared. So when I take an integral like this, um, the first thing that I might do is try to look to see, is there any way that I could rewrite this using one of my integration formulas? Because these things are going to be very helpful for us as we move forward. And we can see right down here that the integral of secant squared of x dx is equal to tangent of x. Because remember, the root of tangent is secant squared. So how could I, what could I do to change this so that it's just an integral of secant, um, secant 
of x squared dx. Well, there's another property saying that if I have a constant multiplied with a function under an integral, I can take that constant k out. I can take it out of the integral. So let's follow that property and let's take the 3 out and we'll multiply by the integral of secant squared of x dx. So secant squared x, if I in integrate that, that would be equal to tangent. And that constant of 3 would be multiplied by that tangent once I find the antiderivative of secant squared of x. Make sure that you're also adding your plus c at the end because it is an indefinite integral. Got something a little bit more complicated here with 5, but again, follow your steps and uh, make sure that you're breaking this problem up into smaller problems. It's a lot like when we took derivatives. We could always break a problem into smaller derivatives and take the parts of that. Um, obviously here, I have a different type of problem with a rational and a special root in the bottom. So before we move forward here, let's go ahead and try to see if we can simplify this um, rational function. I see that my denominator is a monomial. So whenever that's the case, I could always break this up into two smaller fractions. So let's say we have an x over an x squared, or square root of x, sorry, plus 1 over the square root of x. And that sum is being different, um, taking the inter integral of with respect to x. And because I have a sum of two different smaller functions, I have my sum property right down here saying that if I'm taking the integral of two different functions, plus or minus, I can break that into two smaller integrals of each respective function. So when I take the integral of x over the square root of x, remember this could be simplified, right? This is the power of 1, this is the power of 1 half. So 1 minus 1 half is just a square root of x dx plus 1 over the square root of x. Let's rewrite this so we better understand this. This is going to be the integral of x to the 1 half power, negative, because it's in the denominator, of dx. So we've already integrated that first piece before in our first example. We said with this 1 half power, this is going to be 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power, plus c, plus 1 negative 1 half power. So let's think about this. I want to raise the power by 1. So negative 1 half plus 1 gives me 1 half. Right? Negative 1 half plus 1 is going to give me 1 half. And then when I want to bring that down, I want to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to multiply by 2 over 1, or 2, plus c. Now one thing we can do here, a constant plus a constant is always equal to a different constant. So go ahead and just combine those two numbers. It's not that important that they are written separately. So here we have a final integral, which is 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power plus 2x to the 1 half power plus c. Last but not least, we got some trig functions here. We have a sine and a cosine squared of x. So uh, whenever possible, we're going to try to change this um, and make it so that there's no denominators. That'll make our problem a lot easier when doing integration. So if I'm given a sine over cosine squared of x, I want to see if I can turn this into any of my special formulas. Um, and that might mean taking stuff and turning um, sec um, secants and tangents and cosecants into sines and cosines, or also maybe going the other way around. Because a lot of my integration with trig functions start with secants and um, cosecants and tangents and, and cotangents. So maybe I can rewrite this as maybe a sine of x over a cosine of x times, there's an extra cosine in the denominator, so 1 over cosine x dx. Now writing it and separating cosine squared into cosine times cosine, what that does is it kind of isolates or, or kind of shows me that I have a sine over cosine in one piece. And I also have a 1 over cosine in the second piece. The reason that would be helpful is because sine over cosine turns into tangent of x. And 1 over cosine turns into secant of x. We're going to integrate this with respect to dx. 
So now, the reason I've converted that into secants and tangents is because it fits one of my properties that I have here below, that secant of x times tangent of x, or tangent of x times secant of x, uh, multiplication is commutative, is equal to secant of x plus c. So I can rewrite this as the antiderivative is going to be secant of x, and I'm going to add a plus c in there for my integral. All right? So again, we're using these integration formulas. We're simplifying our expressions before we dive right into integration. And you should continue that process um, as working on um, integrals until we learn new um, strategies to be used. So let's go ahead and look at some other problems here, um, like number seven to number eight. Again, feel free to pause and try them on your own if you'd like. Be careful here, the power rule is stated right here below. But be really careful um, about using it in this case. x minus 5 is inside the power of 2. This x minus 5 is inside the power of 2. And we don't quite know how, in, how integration is going to change when using the uh, chain rule like we learned in, derivative, in derivatives in chapter 3. So we have to be really careful about how we apply chain rule when we get to integration, and that'll be coming up in later videos and later lessons. So let's just look at this first integral. Um, if you were to do it based off of the integration formulas that we have today and what we've known, it would probably be best to go ahead and expand this expression and rewrite x minus 5 squared as x squared minus 10x plus 25 dx. Now that I've written it out like that, because these are sum and differences, I can integrate these pieces separately. A lot like when we did with derivatives, right? Um, we can integrate parts separately. So when I integrate um, x to the second power, I'm going to add 1 to the power. And I'm going to take that n, which was 2, 2 plus 1, and put it in the denominator. So I'm going to add a 1 third out in front. Minus 10x, when I raise the power by 1, it's going to be 2. And I'm going to divide by um, uh, n, which in this case would have been 1. Um, but remember, I had a constant out in front, so that 10 is really going to be a five or ten divided by two or five <coughs> plus derivative of a, uh, integral of a constant is going to be that constant times x and the last thing I need to make sure I add into there is a plus c to represent uh, any possible constant term that could come out of it okay and again a lot like number seven there we don't know the chain rule yet and like in number eight we don't know the product rule and how that applies to integration so for this point, at this point in our, in our class, we're going to go ahead and expand, expand this product. And when I do that, I end up with the integral of 3x squared minus 2x plus a 3x. It's going to give me a plus x and then minus 2 dx. And when I integrate this, um, raise my power by 1. 3 divided by 3 would be 1, so that's going to be 1 there. And um, back out of here, we're going to take our 1 power, and we're going to raise it by 1, so it will be x squared. And then we're going to take that 2, and we're going to put it in the denominator. Um, so we'll put that as a 1 half out in front. Minus a 2x, plus always a c, plus c as well. All right. So again, <clears throat> the words I'm using in terms of how I uh, integral or, take in, or do integration, make sure that you're putting that in your own words so you can explain it and understand it. Um, it would really be beneficial as you're going through your uh, practice problems for homework that you um, learn how to phrase it in your own way and best understand it. There are two more pages of notes here that we'll come back to and work on next class, and we're going to see how taking an inter integral over an interval um, is the same thing as finding the area under a curve and that um, correlation between the two using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So 
At this point, you can uh, stop with the notes and then jump into the practice problems that are posted on Google Classroom. Thanks. Have a great day.